Hi, everybody, wherever you may be. My name is Larry. My call signs Kilo 7 Hotel November. I'd like to welcome you back to my shack here in Northwest Oregon. This is Ham Radio Live, show number 97, part one. I'd like to invite you to please hit the subscribe button. The subscribe button helps people find us here on YouTube. I promise you there's not going to be any ads here. I've had people tell me you need to put ads. You need to put ads. I won't do it. I just don't. I, I'm not a person that likes to watch YouTube videos and hit the skip button. It drives me crazy. I just don't like it. So I refuse to monetize the channel. So my hope is that you folks will subscribe because it'll help folks that would like to learn about ham radio come on the show. Hi, Kilo Echo 6, Delta Oscar Alpha, my buddy's K6 DOA. Love that. That's such a great call. That's a great call. How you doing, buddy? Good to see you. I would have done this show earlier, except for um, it all started with Christmas lights. Literally, you know, we had a Christmas light issue on our tree. We're late putting our tree up. Anyway, ran into a car problem, and all of a sudden, no heat. And then I'm looking at the temperature gauge. Yeah, it's up like at H. I'm like, oh no. Yeah, so it took a while to get home, and yeah, so the van is in for repairs. I think it's a heater core issue. We'll figure it out. Anyway, welcome to the show. We're going to talk about general today because we've got John and Greg, people who are technicians now, brand new hams, and we'd like to see if we can help them to license up to general. I guess some 97% of all ham radio frequencies. Welcome to the show. So we're going to focus only on general questions on this show. And then in part two, I'm going to talk to you about the radio I waited a long time for. We're going to go over a review of it. Plus, we'll talk about it, a little about the history. If you're ever interested in purchasing uh, Yesu FTDX 5000, I know a lot too much, actually, probably about them, but <laughs> like, like it's, you know, OCD too much. But you'll be able to learn some stuff if you're ever interested in buying one. And we'll see about making some QSOs with it. But I'd like to make this show and just dedicate it to the folks that would like to license up because that's important. It really is. That's why we came in the first place, why, why I built the channel. So question number one on the general FCC license in the U.S. is this, which is nothing to do with the license exam. <laughs> yep, that's the connection for the MFJ998 and the ALS 1306. Sorry, guys. Okay, first questions. What is one way that RF energy can affect human body tissue? RF meaning radio frequency. All right. A, it heats body tissue. B, it causes radiation poisoning. C, it causes the blood count to reach a dangerously low level. Or D, it cools body tissue. The answer is A. RF energy is like a burn, you know? If you get close, like if you grab an antenna, right? And you're transmitting. Okay. First of all, don't do that. Second of all, don't try that. Don't do the triple dog dare thing. Just not worth it. It'll heat body tissue. It could cause you serious burns. So don't even do it. Not worth it. And in this case, what the question really has to do with is not only like touching an antenna when you're transmitting, but also it could have to do with radio frequency exposure levels. So it can heat body tissue. Please keep that in mind. All right. Question two, what should be done by any person preparing to climb a tower that supports electrically powered devices? All right. There's a question here that there probably is some answers that folks could find plausible. For example, unground the base of the tower, which is number C. A, no. Notify the electric company that a person will be working on the tower. Could you imagine? No. It's B, make sure all the circuits that supply power to the tower are locked out and tagged. Okay, the reason you do that is because, of course, you don't want power to the tower, first of all, and you want to tag them because you could have more than one antenna on the tower. You could have a Yagi, you could have another directional beam, you could have a, a dipole, you could have lots of different antennas. Tag them. Make sure you know which ones are which, so when you put them back up, you put them back the right way. But just make sure everything's offline. No power to the tower. If you remember that, <laughs> you should be okay. All right. On the general, next questions. What is the maximum transmitting power an amateur station may use in the 12 meter band? All right, now let's let's look at this. Remember, 11 meters is CB. That's citizens band. Some people call it chicken band, but you know it's citizens band. 
this is just barely, <laughs> I mean, just barely right by the CB band. The answer is 1500 watts, Pep. Yep, you can use 1500 watts on the 12 meter band. No problem at all. So just keep that in mind. The only frequency you got to worry about, you know, unless you're really going up like above seven, you know, above uh, six meters is you want to make sure and watch it on 30. It's 200 watts on 30 and that's digital only. So keep that in mind, right? 1500 watts pep on 12 meters. Keep that in mind. You'll be golden. In fact, it's probably easier just to remember anything that is a uh, lower frequency than six meters, sorry, 70 centimeters, technically anything lower than that is 1500 watts because now this is again keep in mind if you are a general or you are a amateur extra 200 watts on 30 meters and 30 meters is all digital that's just the way it works you just have everyone has to do that it's the way it works all right next question on the general for the current general exam in the united states who may receive credit for the elements represented by an expired amateur radio license okay so let's say your license expires things happen right life just happens and you don't renew your license is it a any person who can demonstrate that they once held an fcc issued general advanced or amateur extra class license that was not revoked by the fcc can receive credit for it b anyone who held an fcc issued amateur radio license that has been expired for not less than five years and not more than 15 years. C, any person who previously held an amateur radio license issued by another country, but only if that country has a current reciprocal agreement, licensing agreement, you know, with the FCC. Or D, only persons who once held an FCC issued novice, technician, or technician plus license. Answer is A. Just any person who's held a license that was not revoked by the FCC. Look at the word revoke. That's a good cue to know that's the right answer just for receiving credit in case you don't get your license renewed within the 10 years, you know, the time frame it takes for it to be time for renewal. Which of the following conditions required require, sorry, a, a licensed amateur radio operator to take specific steps to avoid harmful interference to users or facilities. So this is to other users or facilities that might be on the hand bands, could be on the radio in some way. Okay. This is a good question. So you've got a station. It doesn't have to have an amplifier. Could be running just hundred Watts. A, when operating within one mile of an FCC monitoring station. B, when using a band where the amateur service is secondary. C, when a station is transmitting sp- Spread spectrum emissions. Say that three times fast. D, all the choices are correct. It is D. Yeah. These conditions require a ham radio operator to take specific steps to avoid harmful interference to other users or facilities. If an FCC monitoring station or an FCC office is, you know, close by, you got to be careful. Okay. Also remember the amateur radio service is always secondary, okay? And if you're transmitting spread spectrum emissions, which technically means you're going over the three or four kilohertz, really it's three kilohertz upper side or lower side band. Well, you know, we've talked about that before. ESSB I think has a great thing in the world. It's great to hear your full signal with all the fidelity, it's wonderful but not at the expense of taking away bandwidth from people who'd like to use it and need it, especially when the bands are crowded. That's really important. We've got to share the bands. That's really important, my friends. Okay, next question. Which of the following is a recommended way to break into a contact when using phone? Now, we just did this in the last show. Remember, we talked to a couple of great hams in Arizona. Kilo Fox, what was it here? We talked to, hold on, Kilo 7, I can't remember now, sorry. Both were in Arizona because I tagged them and logged them on QRZ. So both were in Arizona and both great singles too. So the answer is A, say your call sign during a break between transmissions by the other stations. Once you hear a break between the two of them, 
unless they're just like really fast. And sometimes hams can be just super fast, ready to hit the mic button. And then it's hard to get a word in, hard to get a break. You just simply say your call sign. That's it. And then like what happened on the QSO in the previous show, they'll repeat back or they'll say, is there a break or a break station come back? Something like that. But they'll acknowledge you. That's really important. Just say your call sign. That's it. And sometimes I say for a quick one, I don't mean to go too long with it, but I also don't want them to think that I'm trying to butt in and just, you know, become part of the conversation. That's all. Okay. Next question. On the general, which of the following complies with good amateur practice when choosing a frequency on which to initiate a call? The answer is C, follow the voluntary band plan for the operating mode you intend to use. This is really important, okay? Remember, it's a voluntary band plan. This isn't a law. This isn't something that's set in stone that you have to do it. We volunteer to do this. So in doing so, there's a lot of trust that's put into us as ham radio operators to follow the rules of the voluntary band plan. For example, on 40 meters, if you see a single sideband signal is coming from maybe, I don't know, the Falkland Islands, you really need the Falkland Islands, but they're at 7.110. And you know, the band plan says 7.125. You need to let it go. It's not part of the band plan. That's hard to do sometimes. Remember, it's a voluntary band plan, so we've got to follow it exactly to the letter. Also keep in mind, for folks that are technicians that want to be generals, a couple things. Not a lot of math. Don't get overwhelmed thinking, gosh, I can't pass the general. I'm not good at math. There won't be. There won't be more than like two questions that really have to do with math computations. You'll be really struck by lightning if you have three. I'm serious. It's very rare to see two. Three is almost impossible. So don't worry so much about the math stuff. Focus on schematics. Schematics will help you. They really will. Look at the schematics. Memorize them. That'll help you greatly. Also, really start to learn the band plan. The band plan will help you quite a bit because it not only will help you when you study for the exam, but also when you start to use your radio because there are parts of certain bands you still can't use as generals. So having it known before you go is really going to be a big help to you, okay? So two good tips for everybody that like to be a general. Which of the following are least like, sorry, least reliable for long distance communication during periods of slow solar activity, as in right now, we're at the low part of the sun cycle. We're coming up though. The answer is D. Now this one is one that can throw people, okay? Least reliable for low solar activity. Okay, 20 is always pretty reliable. 40 is always pretty reliable. 160 and 80 are always pretty reliable. But 15, 12, and 10 are getting up there. Those bands can be difficult during low sunspot activity. Okay, so once we get over 20, well, 17 technically, but 12, 15, 10, 6, okay, those HF bands can be really hard to do. Hi, Ron. Victor Kilo. Three Foxtrot Union Charlie. Yeah, good to see you, Ron. Happy, it's Wednesday there. Happy Wednesday to you, buddy. Good to see you. All right, we're trying to help some folks out to license up on the general tonight. And we're going to come back with a special show on the ASU 5000. I hope you like it. Next question What usually happens to radio waves when frequencies below the MUF, so this is below the maximum usable frequency, but above? The lowest usable frequency, what happens to those radio waves when they are sent into the ionosphere? Do they bend back to Earth? Do they pass through the ionosphere? Do they get amplified by interaction with the ionosphere? Or are they bent and trapped in the ionosphere evermore to circle the Earth? The answer is A. They're bent back to the earth. Okay, that's just simply how HF works. It's pretty simple. When we have a an MUF number, okay, that is, you know, frequencies are workable below that number, but above the lowest usable frequency, so above the lowest usable frequency and below the most or maximum usable frequency, they're going to be bent back to earth, okay? That's the best way to describe it. Victor Alpha 3, Foxtrot, Union, Charlie. 
Good evening, Ron. Good to see you, buddy. Or good morning. Good morning where you are. Good morning, buddy. Why are HF scatter signals in the skip zone usually weak? This is usually on 10 and 6 meters, okay? The answer is A. Only a small part of the signal energy is scattered into the skip zone. Think of this question as little clouds of unseen ions. That's it. Unseen ions. It's kind of like a cloud. Like we look at clouds in the sky, right? They're visible because you see the water vapor, right? But when we're talking about the ionosphere, it's a different story because the ionosphere is invisible to the naked eye. But there are clouds up there that are supercharged of ions, right? The ions are in there, and that's how we get that great magical 10 and 6 meter skip. The problem is when they bounce into those, like a signal bounces into them, they go a lot of different directions. Think of like a broken mirror, okay? You have a broken mirror and you shine light onto it, the radio reflects a whole lot of different directions. Exactly the same with your radio wave, exactly the same. So that's why when you have something hitting the ionosphere in that situation, it reflects in lots of different ways. You can hear echo, you can hear distortion, you can hear a lot of changes to an audio signal or a digital signal. For example, if you're using packet or something like that, a lot of retransmit requests might be sent because it's coming through different paths. It's very, very different. You'll know when you hear it because it's definitely something you don't forget. It's, it's very unique, no question. Next on the general, why is high input impedance desirable for a voltmeter? Without getting too deep into this, it decreases the loading on circuits being measured. Remember, when using a voltmeter, you're using a little bit of current because you got to check how it's working, okay? So by using a high impedance, a high input impedance on the voltmeter, you're not loading the circuit up too much. You're not, you're not causing any potential damage to it. That's all. So high input impedances are always desirable for voltmeters because it doesn't cause a lot of load to the circuit that's being measured. Remember, you got to send some current in there to see how it's working, okay? Next question. What is one good way to avoid unwanted effects of stray radio frequency energy in an amateur station? This one should be tattooed in your brain. <laughs> it's true. A, connect all equipment grounds together. B, Install an RF filter in series with the ground wire. C, use a ground loop, ground loop for best conductivity. Ground loops are not good. Whenever you see ground loops, throw that one out. They're not a good thing. D, install a few ferrite beads on the ground wire where it connects to your station. No. The answer is A, connect all your equipment grounds in one place. Simple. It's real simple. Unless you have a ground bus, which is basically a bar and everything is loaded right in the same area, it's going to be grounded exactly the same. Make one common point your ground. And that's it. That's all you have to do. Ground loops are terrible. You don't want to deal with them because they mess up your incoming receiver. It causes you a mess. You don't want that. So ground loops, just once you see that, throw it out. Okay? All right. Next question. What's the purpose of a speech processor as used in a modern transceiver? It increases the intelligibility of transmitted phone signals during poor conditions. Here's a good example. It's not as it's not really similar, I guess, as it is on a ham radio, but it's close. Okay. Here's my station. Here's here's me talking to you right now on YouTube with speech processing on. And here's me not. Okay. Hear the difference? Big difference, right? Now I'm using it again. Okay. It increases the intelligibility of transmitted phone signals during poor conditions because a, a speech processor essentially adds a compressor. It adds compression and it adds a little bit of exciter into your microphone to help you be heard better. Now, you can't overdrive it. If you do, you'll get splatter. You sound distorted then. So be careful. Ask for audio reports. Don't be afraid to ask for how your audio signal sounds, especially when you're starting out. Hams are more than willing to work with you on that or listen in on a dummy load. Just hook up your headphones, listen in. 
you're transmitting into the dummy load, so you're not going to send the signal out over the airwaves, you'll be fine. That's a good way to do it. But just don't overuse your processing because when you do, it can have some pretty undesirable effects. Similar to like if you're using a, a higher end microphone to run through your rig. Nothing wrong with that. I personally don't do it. And the reason I don't do it is because my whole idea is I try to run mid. I'm heavy on mid range. I really want to use mid range, especially right around oh, 1.2 to 2.5 kilohertz of mid because I know that's where the human voice is best articulated. I want the station on the other end to hear me. But if you want to use maybe a quality microphone and have a little bit more of a polished sound to your station, remember a couple things like we said in the microphone show. You only have about 2.9 on, on ICOM to 4K of bandwidth on Yesu, some Yesu products, plus Flex can go way out there, but we're just gonna stick with like, you know, ICOM, Kenwood, and Yesu. You only have about 2.9 to 4 kilohertz of bandwidth. Don't load it up with bass, because bass kills you when it comes to QSOs. It sounds really heavy. See what I mean? That's what happens when you use too much bass. It, it comes across as being really like this and you're trying to make contact and you can't understand the person. And to them, it sounds great because they're looking for that radio sound. They don't understand. They put way too much low end and the low frequencies are overpowering everything else. And the people on the other end are not hearing a quality signal. So focus on the mid range there, okay? And on your processing, just don't drive it too hard. All right. Next question. Which of the following is a disadvantage of using wind as the primary source of power for an emergency station? So you've got the power out. You need to be able to get on the air. Maybe it's a storm or something. Could be. You never know. So in this case, we've got to think practicality, okay? How practical is using wind? A, the conversion efficiency from mechanical energy, meaning a spinning motor, electric motor, spun by a propeller that's, you know, powered by the wind, is, uh, sorry, uh, let me repeat this because I went too far deep. The conversion efficiency from mechanical energy to electrical energy is less than 2%. That's incorrect. The voltage and current ratings of such systems are not compatible with amateur equipment. That's also incorrect. There are stations that have used wind. C, a large energy storage system is needed to supply power when the wind isn't blowing. That's correct. D, all these choices are correct. No, no, it's just simply C. A large energy storage system is needed to supply power when the wind's not blowing. So keep that in mind if you're going to use wind. Now, solar's different. With solar, you'll be able to use, you know, a reasonable size battery, but with solar, you can charge it back up with a charge controller and you could just keep rolling. I know people that use them 24 seven on solar. No joke. <laughs> Ron hashtag all the base. Not that's great. It's true. Don't use too much base. It'll just ruin your signal. Okay. Next few questions. Which of the following causes opposition to the flow of alternating current in an inductor? Okay. This isn't, the opposition of flow in a circuit, okay? An item that causes opposition of current flow in a circuit is a diode, remember that, okay? Alternating current, when we're talking about it in this question, what, sorry, which of the following causes opposition to the flow of alternating current in an inductor, okay? It's reactants, okay? reactants. Remember, reactance is the opposite of inductance, okay? Inductance is something's ability to induce or to bring in. React is something that pushes away. It's kind of like when you put two magnets together and they force each other apart. That's reactance, just like that. Inductance is that just one magnet to a piece of inductive material. And remember what it does? Sticks right to it. Good way to remember that, okay? Last few on the general, because we want to help some folks license up. We haven't done enough of these. What's the RMS voltage across a 500 turn secondary winding in a transformer if the 2,250 turn primary is connected to 120 volts AC? The answer is C. It's 
5.7 volts, okay? Take a good look at this. 500 turns secondary winding in a transformer with a 200, sorry, 2,250 turn primary winding that's connected to 120 volts AC, 26.7. All right, last few. What is the approximate junction threshold voltage of a conventional silicon diode? Now you're probably saying, why do I need to know this? <laughs> I'm not going to build a radio. I'm not going to build a power supply. I'm not going to build an amplifier. Well, you might someday. It's not bad to know this stuff. And the, really the point is you have to know it. You have to have the answers, okay? The answer in this case, the approximate th threshold junction voltage is 0 0.7 volts of a conventional silicon diode, okay? 0 0.7 volts, easy to remember, right? 0 0.7, just remember, touch down almost, okay? Next, which of the following is an analog integrated circuit? So again, we're talking non-digital. Analog is not digital. Excuse me. A NAND gate or an NAND gate, that's definitely digital, okay? It's part of a transistor. It's how a transistor works. It's a special transistor. We all know a microprocessor is a computer. That's digital. A frequency counter is definitely digital. Linear voltage regulator, however, is analog. So remember, when we're talking about an analog integrated circuit, a linear voltage regulator is that part that's analog. The rest are all digital. NAND gate, microprocessors, frequency counters, all those things are digital. Okay? Pretty easy. You guys are going to pass. I know you guys are. Greg, I know you're going to pass this. I know you are. Easy. What determines the frequency of an LC oscillator? Is it A, the number of stages in the counter, B, the number of stages in the divider, C, the inductance and capacitance in the tank circuit, or D, the time delay of the lag circuit? In this case, the answer is C. It's the inductance and the capacitance in the tank circuit. LC oscillator has to do with inductance and capacitance. Remember that. Pretty simple. Remember, most antenna tuners work on an L network, okay? A lot of them work on L networks, and a lot of them, basically, all they do is find a way for your antenna and your radio that might be this far off with an impedance match to be friends. That's it. It lets the radio work. And sometimes you have to use a, a good L network um, antenna tuner to be able to use it. Well, your impedance may be quite a bit off. That's why the antenna tuner is there. Now, does that mean then your antenna is going to run full power? No, it means your radio can still use the antenna. You'll use it at less power, but at least you can use it. Good way to look at it. Okay, this will be the last three for the general. Okay. And this is a really good example to segue from the last question. If the SWR of an antenna feed line is five to one, stop there. <laughs> Just stop, stop right there. If the SWR of an antenna feed line is five to one, then look at the last part after the comma. What is the resulting SWR on the feed line? Okay, we'll read the whole question now. If the SWR on an antenna feed line is five to one, and a matching network at the transmitter, this is an antenna tuner, okay, is adjusted to one-to-one -one SWR, what's the resulting SWR on the feed line? So essentially, you have an SWR of a feed line which is five to one, okay? So you've got a mismatch. You use an antenna tuner. What does that mean the resulting SWR on the feed line is? It's still five to one. It's just, all it means is that your radio and your antenna can work together. It's still mismatched. The, the thing you give up is the ability to transfer more power to the antenna. It's basically brought in as heat to the ground in the coax. That's all. You're warming the ground. 
that's really what you're doing when you have that mismatch issue. So keep in mind on that question, if you're dealing with an SWR issue of five to one, four to one, three to one, 12 to one, I don't care. The point is that's what, excuse me, that's the wrong question. That's what you do. That's, that's what it is. It starts at that number and it's going to end at that number. All an antenna tuner does or an impedance matching network does is just to make your radio happy. That's it. Nothing more. Last question. Which of the following describes a log periodic antenna? The answer is A, length and spacing of the elements increase logarithmically from one end of the boom to the other. Okay, so the length and spacing of, you have essentially you have one long element, okay? And then you have many elements that cross in the middle of it. Okay, so the length and spacing of those elements increase logarithmically from one end of it to the other. Okay, remember, the smallest of those elements is always the director. The longest is always the reflector. That's a good way to remember it, okay? So think of it on the small end as that's the kind of the steering wheel for the antenna, right? That's the director of it. The back end is the backseat driver telling you always what to do. Okay, it's the reflector. So then right before that reflective element, you've got the driven element. Okay, the driven element goes and as it shoots back, hits the reflective element, goes forward, and that directive element helps to steer the signal in a straight path. That's how it works. So there's some general stuff. I hope it helps you guys that are studying up for the general exam. I want to encourage you that you can get that license passed. I really mean that. Don't take it so seriously and worry about math questions that happen. You can pass the test. You really can. Remember, and this is important, if you study hard enough on your schematics, you'll be ahead because you're probably gonna get one or two at least of those. And if you work hard enough to understand your FCC rules, that's very important, as well as frequencies, band plans, how you know, lower side band and upper side band work, those things will help you in that test. They're not going to be a whole lot of stuff to throw you. The whole idea is to help you. They, we all want you on the air. We do. We're trying to actually make it as easy as we can but not make it so easy that anybody can get on the air and recklessly use this radio because it's got power. You can do a lot with it. And we respect that power as ham radio operators. Thanks for watching. We'll be back with a special show dedicated to the ASU FTDX 5000. This show is about just trying to help folks to get them on the air to a higher license class. I wanna thank you for watching. I do mean that sincerely. If you'd be kind enough, please hit the subscribe button. Tell a friend about the channel. If they have an interest in ham radio, we'd be happy to answer your questions. And if I don't know the answer, I'll send you to somebody who does. By the way, tomorrow, very special show at 20 Zulu. That's 12 noon Pacific here in North America. We'll have Jim Heath. That's W6LG. He has hosted for five years now on YouTube the very special show called Ham Radio Basics. Jim is one of the nicest people under the sun, and he has done so many videos to help ham radio operators understand the basic concepts of everything ham radio. We're so excited to have him. Please get ready. Have your questions ready. You're in for a real treat tomorrow at 20 Zulu with Jim Heath, W6LG. Until next time. God bless you. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll look forward to seeing you soon from the shack of Kilo 7 Hotel November. My name is Larry. It's been my honor and privilege to spend this time with you. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye, everybody.